Hi, and welcome to another Gorgeous Arts class. Today I'm going to demonstrate how I turned this into this beautiful, glossy, glossy finished gourd with my process of applying epoxy to my gourd art. First, I'm going to discuss the various finish options for gourd art and why I choose uh, epoxy over the other finishes and when. Um, then we're going to go over the materials list and prep uh, to make this happen and then I'm going to take you outside and show you how it's done. Okay, so let's talk about finish options for gourds. Um, there's polyurethane, there's some natural finishing waxes, and now a new thing that's come out is we're figuring out how we can apply epoxy onto our gourds. Um, so when it comes to the finishing waxes and some of the other natural things, I've tried them. I didn't like them. They weren't for me, but I do know that there are a lot of Gourd artists that swear by it. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, you might want to reach out um, on the For Love of Gourds or one of the other Gourd Art uh, Facebook groups and see about whether or not there's more information on those waxes. Uh, obviously today's video focuses on um, an epoxy coat for a gourd. Uh, so that's where we're going to, to stay. I just wanted to take a brief minute to talk about uh, polyurethane and specifically spray polyurethane um, and why that comes into play when I choose what finish um, I'm going to put onto a piece. So these pieces over here have been spray polyed. Um, my dancing fox I did in a gloss just because I felt like that was um, most fitting for its design and I really wanted um, the fox and the copper leaf to stand out and um, just wanted to kind of showcase the uh, raw interior flesh of the gourd just a little bit more. Um, on this piece I decided to go with a satin finish just because I thought that it was more in keeping with the old world um, overall look on that. This one is not complete yet. Um, one thing I did learn is that if you're going to use any kind of leafing pro process, whether it be gold or copper or silver, I did copper on this one, um, I don't do any leafing until after I have done the spray poly and it has had time to fully cure. Um, if you do the leafing beforehand, it gets lost. It actually dulls it out just a little bit. Um, so that was a waste of time for me the first time I did it because I did the gold leafing, I did the poly, um, and then I had to go back over it and re-gold leaf those areas. Um, lesson learned, now I don't uh, gold leaf until I poly. Um, so now, uh, one of the reasons why I would use spray poly versus a brush on poly is um, I don't want my colors to run or to move. I've got a very colorful piece here. I actually haven't decided on this piece whether I'm going to um, poly it, whether it's going to be matte or gloss, although I'm 90% I'm sure it's going to be gloss, or whether or not I want to do um, epoxy on it uh, just to make it that much glassier. The biggest difference that I find um, once you epoxy a piece is it doesn't quite feel like a gourd so much anymore. Um, it feels more like glass, maybe like plastic, um, something to that effect. The look of it is absolutely beautiful. Um, and if it were for the changing of the feel, um, I might epoxy every piece that I do. Uh, but there's a couple of reasons why I'm, I, I wouldn't do that with this. Um, for my my more valuable art pieces like Dancing Fox, like Old, old World, um, these pieces are priced in the hundreds of dollars range. Um, uh, the spray poly, you can still, it still feels like a gourd. It still feels like a natural product. 
whether it's the matte or the shiny, um, you know that you're dealing with a natural product when you touch it and you give it a little extra love. With this, you're not quite sure what it is. Um, I really like the epoxy for my accent lamps and my flicker pieces. A lot of times the accent lamps are um, made out of much thinner cords, so they're going to um, have more of a tendency to have the possibility of them cracking or breaking, um, not just during the completion phase, but even in transport or at somebody's home. So therefore, um, when I have a super thin, super fragile cord, like my unicorn one here uh, was, or I have a lot of cuts that are going to make a piece, even if you hit it wrong, it might just break off. Um, or I just really want that special glassy look. Those are the reasons why I would choose to use epoxy over the spray poly. Um, so that's what we've got here. This one hap actually happens to be a little bit thicker one. So I would really only choose to epoxy this one um, if I really yeah. want that high, high gloss look to it. And, and I'm, I'm getting to a point where this needs to be finished. So I have to make that decision, but um, it'll come to me when the moment's right. Okay, quick set change. And now we're back and we're going to talk about all the things that go into um, making this process work. So number one is prepping your gourd, making sure that it is 100% completed. Any carving, burning, coloring, anything like that that you want done to the gourd, you want to make sure it's done before you do this process because there is no access to um, the actual gourd itself once this is done. Um, now, on a side note on that, I have not done gold leafing on an epoxied gourd yet. So, um, in reference to my earlier comment that I don't do the gold leafing on my poly pieces until after they've been polyed, I don't have an answer for that yet on the gourds. So, um, getting down to it, um, when you're talking about epoxy and you're talking about gourds, epoxy is self-leveling and, um, you know, it's, it reacts to gravity. So, you know, when I first started thinking about, okay, if I wanted to do an epoxy coat on a gourd, how would that work? What would that look like? Um, the first thing that came to mind is that I would need some sort of um, a spinning device um, to make that work. And um, right about that time, they were coming up with rotisseries for um, doing epoxy on tumblers. And um, that's not going to work for a gourd because they're very small. Um, tumblers are much lighter weight than uh, a gourd can be. And the, they're basically made for just that. And you're not going to get a, a stable, rigid um, hold onto the gourd um, with that uh, with that rotisserie. So then I um, came up with getting just a regular grill rotisserie. Oh, see? stuff is blocking it regular grill rotisserie from um, the, the local home improvement store it comes with a rod it comes with um, these support pieces although I very rarely use them um, and then two other pieces that you'll see in the demonstration that are very vital to um, getting the rotisserie on um, uh, keeping the bar onto the rotisserie so then so we've got a bar and we've got a gourd but how do we keep it um how do we keep it stable on this bar um so uh, beautiful wonderful uh, my significant other will gave me the idea to use um these they're peanut sponges so the first attempt at this um did not include a plastic bag and the sponges stuck to the inside of the gourd so that was um that was a fail so then we realized that we needed to put a plastic bag um to create the barrier between the gourd and the sponges that worked out really really well except for the fact that um if there were any carvings any holes and the epoxy got through then the bag stuck to the epoxy so then i started using petroleum jelly um, Vaseline to uh, protect the bag. So you'll see that in the demonstration. Um, we get that 
on the bag. So we've got the sponges, we've got the bag, um, the sponges. I have lots of them and you'll see that in the demonstration as well as I'm putting them into the gourd. So as far as the, the actual epoxy materials themselves, um, we've got the, the epoxy that I use is stone coat countertops quick coat epoxy. It is the only epoxy that I use. I have tried um, at least five other brands to do this process and none of them, none of them have worked near as well as this is. I would say if you're going to do an epoxy coat on a gourd, you need to use the stone coat. Um, no fail. You have to use the stone coat. Um, then a couple of other important things is um, when I use my, my rubber gloves, I do make sure that I buy ones that actually fit my hands pretty closely. Uh, loose fit, fitting gloves are not going to help you apply the epoxy to the actual gourd itself. Um, I keep a torch handy for um, bubbles. You can get these pretty cheaply on Amazon. They're like, it was like 10 bucks, something like that. Um, and then I have my stir sticks and my measuring cups. Um, I like to keep a little denatured alcohol handy when I'm doing it just to, it, it, it helps with the goop um, that epoxy can do. So then let's talk about where and how we're going to do this. Um, epoxy is very um, temperature uh, sensitive. So uh, most epoxies in this one too is, are going to recommend that you're uh, applying this process in um, a room that's at least 72 degrees. Um, I find 74 is a really good sweet spot. So if it's not warm enough outside, then um, find a well ventilated space inside where you can cover enough floor. You wanna make sure you do floor protection because it will drip. Um, I like to do um, put something down like a clear silicone mat, some molds. Um, I even did some bubble wrap and got some really cool um, honeycomb looking uh, epoxy pieces I'm going to apply to my beehive uh, gourd that I'm working on. So you can play with that a little bit, but just make sure because once that epoxy is on that floor, it's not coming back off. Um, so make sure that there's some floor protection down wherever you're going to do it. Um, in our case, we had a beautiful day uh, last week, so we did it outside. Um, so that should be everything that we need to discuss before the uh, demonstration starts. So um, stay tuned and we're going to go outside. We're going to show you what I did last week. Okay, so we're showing how to put, set up a gourd for rotisserie. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn the bag inside out. The reason why is that these printings do come off with chemicals. So you don't want that. You want the inside out, the clean side of the bag facing the inside of the gourd. All right. So. I have kind of a special starter piece here that's just a little bit of a V shape. So I'm going to take the rod and I'm going to do this. And this is what we're going to put in there. But now I have to do what literally is the most unpleasant part of um, doing a gourd in resin with a rotisserie. And that is Vaselining up the inside of the bag. Um, the lovely thing about resin is it doesn't stick to Vaseline. So um, I learned the hard way with several um, pieces that had gotten basically stuck to the inside of the gourd 
because the resin came through the holes and um, getting that plastic bag out was not at all pleasurable. So as much as this is um, kind of icky to do, it is also very, very vital uh, in the process. So this is not a step you want to skip by any means. But of course, as prepped as I am, I Okay, I'm back. So we're going to anti-goop our hands. We can lay this down if I don't hurt it any. So we'll anti-goop our hands and uh, next thing is we will uh, um, basically get this baggie inside the gourd. All right, just to make sure that I don't have any Vaseline transfer, I'm actually going to use one of my sponges here to hold the neck of the gourd. And then you're going to see, it might be hard to kind of see in the video, but there's an area of the gourd that's quite skinny. We have to get this all the way up to the top if we want good stability. So we're just going to be as gentle as we possibly can, and boom, it is all the way to the top. So now, we're going to take one of our paper towels, we're going to wrap it around there, we're going to be very gentle, I'm not putting any pressure or weight onto the stem because my whole point behind this particular piece is trying to keep that stem as much as humanly possible. So now, we are turning the bag inside out here. And now we get to shove a whole bunch of sponge parts into the bag. The goal is to make sure that the gourd is stable on the rotisserie and will turn correctly. So I've got lots of little bits and pieces of sponge and I just kind of shove them in there to the point that they will eventually hold it tight. I have done this technique with some very oddly shaped gourds and um, I've been able to make it work really well thus far. Since I started using the sponge technique, I haven't had any issues with um, the gourd falling off of the rotisserie or being at a funky angle. But there's some other fail safes we need to do to take care of that as well. So again, we're just shoving in sponges. As long as I can still get my fingers in there, then uh, I don't have enough sponges in there. I'm gonna move up to this because it's starting to get a little extra weight to it. So, and what I might do every now and again is basically hold it and turn it, and if it turns good, then it turns a little too good, so I know I need more, so I'm going to keep on going. Okay, so because of the long stem, I thought this was the easiest way to show this part. I am taking the two ears and I'm going to 
wrap them around my rotisserie base as best as I can. And then I'm going to tie them together, be sure, being sure to control as much of the little taggy parts of the bag as possible. Don't want a lot of stray bag um, when we're dealing with resin and the rotisserie and everything else. All right. So we have a nice clean end here. And then I take one of these office clips and I hold the bag down. See, now I've got a lovely spinning gourd on a rod. Now, while I was loading up the sponges, I did end up getting a little bit of Vaseline on the bottom of the gourd, but it's wiping off pretty easily. All right, so I'm gonna cut away for just a second. And when I come back, I, we will be putting the rotisserie on the spit. Okay, I'm back even though you can't see me. And we're going to attach this piece right here with the fat end. For my rotisserie, I have this little H-shaped thing right here. And I'm gonna put the fat end um, in that H-shaped piece. And I'm going to put, slip the rod in and make sure that I get it into the rotisserie part. And then I'm going to screw it down tight. Not always the easiest thing to do. And then we take the other side and we're going to set it up over here. over here like this. So for balance, I want to give it as much free range play as I can. I like to keep this a little bit longer for balance if I can, but then I want this side to stick out enough, this side to stick out enough so that I can do my epoxy work and not have it affect my table, anything else, my clamp. Okay, so now we have the rotisserie in place. We want to make sure that the line is as straight and even as we can. This line here. And then I'm going to get a big honking clamp that I hate very much because my little tiny hands don't like this clamp. I'm going to clamp this down. Then, because one day I was all full of resin and I turned on and off the button here, um, now I have to use a remote to turn on and off the button. So, okay, so now I've got my resin tools kind of set up here and um, a few of the most important tools is when you're working with epoxy resin you want to wear gloves always um, but especially in our case because we're going to be using our hands to spread so that is very definitely a glove situation but anytime I work with resin and I always grab an extra pair besides the one that I'm putting on before I start working in case I ever need to quickly pull off a glove that's full of resin and put a fresh one back on again because there's something else happening. Another thing I have 
with some newspapers. I'm going to lay one down on the ground near where I'm working so that, again, if I need to, I've got that. I don't care about this table, so I'm not worried about that. Scooch that. So the resin that I use for coating gourds is the Stone Coat Countertops Quick Coat Resin. I have tried lots and lots of different resins. Um, this is the best. It actually has a shorter cure time, and so it sets up on the gourd with the rotisserie in the perfect amount of timing to get a good, beautiful, even coat without it all kind of sagging off the three-dimensionality of the gourd as it's curing. It makes a beautiful coat, um, not at all pitted or anything like that. I've had a few that have done that. Um, so the other important tools is I have my measuring cups here. I have my stir sticks. Anything that you're going to use, I should say I, anything I use with epoxy and, um, uh, and my gourds, I, I use disposable stuff. I bought all this really nice, supposedly reusable silicone stuff, little mixing cups and stir sticks and everything else. Uh, but that silicone seems to collect every piece of lint and anything else you could possibly imagine. And there's critters in our house. We've got a few cats, we've got a dog, and it just got to be a mess. So um, I just use disposable stuff and when I'm done with it, it goes away. And that's just, that's what works for me. Um, another thing I'm going to have at the ready is a torch because this is how you get the air bubbles out of the resin after it's been put on the gourd. I also have um, some mica powder that I'm going to add. Um, this piece, my intention for this piece is to actually, when finalized, resemble Labradorite stone. Um, I don't know if that's what we're going to come up with, but that is my goal. Now on these cups, on the cups that I have, they actually have measuring lines. And I have figured out that most of my gourd pieces, I don't need any more than 50 cc's or two ounces of each um, uh, A and B of the epoxy. Um, sometimes that's a little too much. So I like to have a little something laying around to um, gather if there is too much to use it somehow. So, um, but that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure out my 50 cc's. Actually, I'm gonna go with a full two because that is a slightly longer piece than I've done before. I wanna make sure I have enough. So I'm pouring part A into one cup. And it looks like I probably have about one more gourd left um, worth of epoxy. So we're going to have to get on to stone coat and get that ordered up sooner than later. Okay, and this is the best reason why you measure in two separate cups is because you want to double make sure pouring isn't perfectly accurate. And it looks like I got 
a hair more of the B than the A. And with this stuff, you really do want to be about as accurate as you can be. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a cheapy cup that's a little less expensive than these ones with the measuring lines on them. I'm going to take my stir stick and I'm going to pour first part A because it's actually a little bit thinner. into my cup, making sure I scrape as much out as I possibly can to keep the measurements accurate as much as I possibly can. I'm going to take part B and do the same. Actually, I said that wrong. Part A was the thicker, B is the thinner. I should know that. But I can be forgetful. Okay, so now we're gonna stir this for a while before I add my mica. I wanna get it pretty close to completely mixed in. And I watched a resin video once and she said that when you're mixing, you know you're pretty much ready when you don't see any snot lines in there anymore. And I was like, what the heck is she talking about? And then when you mix it, you see it. There's like, literally it looks kind of like snotty goop in there. And then all of a sudden it'll start to get clear. And that is very cool. So I'm gonna keep mixing. Okay, and because I don't want to mix so long it goes into the curing stage, right about now, because we're very close, I'm gonna go ahead and add my mica powder. And here's what I wanna say about the mica powder. You can always add more, you can't take away. So just keep that in mind, mix in A little at a time see what you think you can always mix in more but if you mix in too much you can't take it away like I said what I'm going for is kind of that gray iridescence of Labradorite And the thought process is that you're going to see that beautiful carnival color come through underneath and it's just going to look like more iridescence underneath the Labradorite. Okay. 
Okay, see if you can see what's happening there color-wise. I think I want to add just a little more gray to that. Okay, so now we're about to get really, really goopy. I'm gonna turn you back around here. All right, here we go. So, this is where it gets really messy really fast. Um, I'm just gonna start taking my hands and literally frosting the gourd with the epoxy and it's going to drip and it's going to make all kinds of noise and it's going to look really weird and uneven at first but it will eventually even itself out You just keep smoothing it on as you go. And you let the rotisserie do its work.
So what I'm seeing is happening here is that the neck is getting a lot of the excess resin because of it being basically down gravity from both the base and the top of this particular shape gourd. So during this initial kind of running and curing process, we're just going to have to keep a little extra eye on it for a little bit. It will continue to self-level. It will continue to work itself out. Now here's exactly what I was talking about. My gloves are full of resin. And I need to torch it now. And yes, I have, in a bad moment, grabbed the torch while my gloves were still full of resin. But I try not to do that because that gets things kind of hung up. I'm getting these really cool resin threads coming out and they're kind of actually putting a pattern on the cord. So I'm kind of thinking that's a little cool. All right, so my gloves are down. I have to go get Okay, so it's been almost 24 hours since we put the epoxy coating on the gourd. Um, you don't typically have to have it on the rotisserie for the full 24 hours. Usually, um, I'll leave it on the rotisserie for about three to four hours. Um, sometimes I can leave it overnight, that's fine. Um, in this case, I just brought it in and put it in a very safe place before I went to bed last night. Um, so here she is. It's kind of hard to see in this lighting. Did not get that dark gray Labradorite kind of um, appearance to it that I wanted, but um, maybe hard to see in the photograph or in the video, but um, if pictures don't do it justice, it is amazingly beautiful. Hopefully I'll get some really good pictures of it um, to add at the end of the video, some really high-end pictures of it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the bar and the sponge and all that other stuff that we did yesterday. We're going to take that out. So there's our office clip. And then I am going to kind of put it between my legs. Oh, here, you can't see that if I do that, so I'll do it this way. 
Now this knot, in this case, is very, very full of epoxy. So maybe I might need to cut and go get a scissors to help me with this. But this is, this is um, epoxy that didn't stick to the bag because of the Vaseline. Um, but that's also kind of sharp, so we don't want that to just fall to the ground. I like to be barefooted, so I don't want to step on that. I am going to go get a scissors. Be right back. Okay, scissors. And we are just going to very carefully, I do not want to do something where the scissors is going to somehow leave a negative scratch or something on the gourd. Um, the epoxy is very good and very strong and very scratch resistant once it's officially fully cured, which sometimes can take, um, I mean, you can touch it and do things with it after 24 hours or so, but as far as really kind of maybe um, packing it up into storage or um, something to that, um, in that vein, you probably want to give it, um, at, they, they say like 30 days. I don't know. Maybe you don't have 30 days from the time you finish a piece to a craft fair. I would say just be as careful with it as you possibly can. Okay, here's one thing that will help. I'm going to take the rod out. You can pull that out. And then I need to just open up this bag. I've got a big chunk. I was actually kind of, oh, look at that. See, that's why we love Vaseline. This whole thing was stuck to the edge. Oh, this is fantastic. This is perfect. Give me just one minute. cut the rest of this bag end off and I'll show you what has happened. Stay. Okay, so not gone. So if not for the Vaseline, this whole big sharp thing right here would be permanently, kind of permanently adhered to the edge of the gourd. Actually, there might even be some of that over here. Um, and what I was going to show you is if that happens, you can use your Dremel tool or whatever to um, keep that, get that off of there and clean that up. I do have a spot that I will need to do that with. And I'm dropping all kinds of epoxy shards all over the floor. So we'll be sweeping and vacuuming after all of this is done. Lots and lots of epoxy shards. Lots and lots of shards from the folds of the bag. And again, they didn't stick to the bag because of the Vaseline. Can't stress that enough how important that is. All right, so now I'm going to get our little fingers in here. We're just going to start pulling out pieces of sponge. I do have some really big, odd plastic tweezers um, that I think I got at Harbor Freight. No, I got it at Axeman um, that I can use if need be to get help get some of these sponge pieces out. So far, we're doing fine. I do have some... issues with. There we go. I just have to get the epoxy to release the bag. It's more of an issue with wrinkles than it is the Vaseline, but it's sometimes a little tougher than I'd like. And actually I'm a little worried about how much I'm holding this handle. So I'm going to come back to being right here. There's another chunk gone. And another sponge piece pulled out.
And another one. And another one. This bag is still going to have technically the Vaseline goop on the outside. So, um, you're going to get kind of goopy doing this too. So, just something to note more than anything. Still pulling sponge pieces out. Is it kind of like a magic trick? Pop. That might end up needing some tweezers. Looks like I may have left some plastic baggie behind on the inside that maybe I didn't get as fully vaselined as possible, but it's a very tiny bit. And I don't know if I'm going to worry about that that much. So there you have it, a de-bagged, de-sponged, resin-coated, lamp gourd. I'm going to clean this up a little bit, um, put it on its unfinished base. Keep that in mind. The base that you see it on um, is not finished yet. And uh, maybe take a few pictures of it in light.